Driving a taxi at night wasn't glamorous, but it paid the bills. Most nights, the worst I had to deal with was the occasional drunk or someone trying to argue down the fare. But this night? This night was different. This night stayed with me. It started with a group of rowdy passengers, a trio of twenty-somethings reeking of booze and bad decisions. They piled into my cab near a downtown club, laughing and shouting over one another. One of them spilled a drink, and I could already tell my car would need a deep clean. Take us to Halston Avenue, one slurred, practically falling into the back seat. I nodded, keeping my eyes on the road and my mouth shut. I just wanted them out of my car as quickly as possible. By the time I dropped them off, the smell had already started to cling. It was sharp and sour, a mix of stale alcohol and sweat. But as I pulled away from the curb, it got worse. Stronger, almost metallic. I rolled down the windows, hoping fresh air would help, but the stench lingered, thick and oppressive. I muttered a curse under my breath. Great, they probably spilled something in the back. When I pulled into an empty lot to inspect the damage, the back seat looked fine, just a few crumpled napkins and an empty beer can. But the smell was stronger now, almost unbearable. I crouched down, searching under the seats and along the floor mats. Nothing. That's when I noticed something odd. The smell wasn't coming from the cabin. It was coming from the trunk. My heart skipped a beat. I hadn't opened the trunk all night, not since I started my shift. A chill crept up my spine as I fished the keys from my pocket. Hands trembling, I unlocked the trunk and lifted it open. Inside was a man. His wrists and ankles were bound with coarse rope, and a filthy gag was tied around his mouth. His eyes were wide with terror, darting wildly as though pleading with me to help him. For a moment I couldn't move. My breath hitched and my mind raced. Who was he? How had he gotten there? I'd been driving all night. Surely I would have noticed someone stuffing a man into my trunk, right? Hang on, I stammered, reaching for my phone. I'm calling the police. He thrashed against the ropes, shaking his head violently. His muffled scream sounded desperate, but I didn't understand. I stepped back, dialing 911 with shaking fingers. The operator's calm voice felt surreal as I tried to explain what I'd found. Stay where you are, she instructed. Officers are on their way. I nodded, even though she couldn't see me, and hung up. The man in the trunk was still struggling, his muffled cries growing weaker. It's okay, I whispered, though I wasn't sure who I was trying to reassure, him or myself. Help is coming. The minutes stretched into what felt like hours. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting someone to appear and claim responsibility for the man in my trunk. But no one came. The lot was eerily quiet the streetlights casting long shadows that danced in the corner of my vision. Finally, the sound of sirens broke the silence. Two patrol cars pulled up, their red and blue lights flashing. A tall, broad-shouldered officer approached me, his face calm but serious. You the one who called this in? he asked. I nodded, pointing to the open trunk. There's, there's a man in there. He's tied up. The officer stepped forward, peering into the trunk. His expression didn't change. He turned back to me, his brow furrowed. Ma'am, there's no one here. My stomach dropped. What? I rushed to the trunk, but it was empty. No ropes, no gag, just the dark, empty space and the faint, lingering smell of metal. No, he was here, I swear he was here. The officer's lips pressed into a thin line. You're the third driver this month to report this. I blinked, my head spinning. What are you talking about? He exchanged a glance with his partner, then looked back at me. Three taxi drivers have called us about the same thing, a bound man in their trunk. But every time we arrive, there's nothing there. No signs of anyone. And those drivers? They've all gone missing. I stumbled back, my knees threatening to give out. Missing? He nodded. Vanished without a trace. Their cars were found abandoned, but the drivers were never seen again. A cold sweat broke out across my forehead. This couldn't be real. It had to be a joke or a mistake. I wasn't going missing. I wasn't. You need to be careful, the officer said, his tone grave. If you see or hear anything else unusual, call us immediately. And if I were you, I'd park this car and take the rest of the night off. I nodded mechanically, but I barely heard him. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what had happened. The officers left, but I stayed in the lot for a long time staring at the empty trunk and trying to convince myself I wasn't losing my mind. 
Finally, I decided to follow their advice. I wasn't in any shape to keep working, not after that. I started the engine and headed home, every shadow on the road feeling like a threat. But the smell didn't go away. Even with the windows down, it clung to the car, stronger now, filling my nose and throat. It wasn't just metallic anymore, it was rancid, putrid, like something rotting. My stomach churned and I gagged, pulling over to the side of the road. As I sat there, trying to catch my breath, I heard it. A soft thump. It came from the trunk. No, I whispered, my voice shaking. No, no, no. The thump came again, louder this time. My whole body went rigid. Slowly, as if in a trance, I turned off the engine and stepped out of the car. The night was silent, the air heavy. Every step toward the trunk felt like walking through molasses. When I reached it, I hesitated. My hand hovered over the latch, my heart pounding so hard it felt like it might burst. Taking a deep breath, I yanked it open. It was empty. But as I stared into the dark void, a pair of hands shot out, grabbing me by the wrists. I screamed, struggling to pull away, but the grip was ironclad. A face emerged from the darkness, my face, bloodied, pale, and twisted into a grotesque grin. You should have listened, it hissed, dragging me forward. The last thing I saw was my own reflection in the rearview mirror, staring back at me from the trunk as the lid slammed shut. And then, nothing. The car was found three days later, abandoned on the side of the road. The trunk was empty. I was never seen again. It was one of those nights that crawled under your skin, where the dark felt heavier than usual. The city had fallen into an uneasy stillness, the kind that amplifies every creak and rustle until it seems alive. I had been driving my cab for hours, my hands glued to the wheel, my eyes heavy from exhaustion. It was the dead hours of the night, and I was counting down the minutes until I could call it quits. As I pulled onto a deserted stretch of road, the dispatcher's voice crackled through the radio. Raj, we've got one last fare for you. Pick up at Old Willow Street. Old Willow Street. A place I avoided if I could. It had a reputation, whispers of disappearances and strange sightings that locals passed off as drunken hallucinations. I sighed, but money was money. Got it, I mumbled, turning the cab around. The street was dimly lit with flickering streetlights that cast erratic shadows. A young man stood near the curb, dressed in a simple hoodie and jeans, his head bowed as though lost in thought. As my cab slowed to a stop, he looked up, and a chill ran through me. He seemed familiar, but I couldn't place him. His features were sharp, his dark eyes piercing. It was like looking at an old photo of myself, one I couldn't quite remember. He opened the door and slid into the back seat without a word. Where to? I asked trying to mask the unease creeping into my voice. He gave an address on the other side of town, but something about the way he said it felt wrong, like he was reciting lines from a play. I nodded and started the meter, the engine purring softly as we pulled away. For the first few minutes, he said nothing. The silence was thick, punctuated only by the soft hum of the tires on the pavement. I glanced at him in the rearview mirror. He was staring out the window, but there was something in his posture, rigid, tense, that unsettled me. So, he said suddenly, his voice calm yet unnervingly familiar. How's your wife doing? My hands tightened on the wheel. She's fine, I replied, forcing a casual tone. Why do you ask? He smiled, a faint curve of his lips that didn't reach his eyes. You've been arguing a lot lately, haven't you? Over little things, the bills, the late nights, it's been getting to her. The word struck me like a slap. How did he know? I hadn't told anyone, not even my closest friends. Do I know you? I asked, my voice sharper than I intended. He leaned back, his expression unreadable. Not yet, but I know you, Raj. I know everything about you. A cold knot formed in my stomach. That's not funny, I said, glancing at him again in the mirror. He was smiling now, a thin, knowing grin. Who are you? He didn't answer. Instead, he shifted his gaze to the dashboard. Remember your father's old watch? The one he gave you before he died? You keep it in the glove compartment, don't you? You never wear it because you're afraid of losing it. But you take it out sometimes. Just to feel close to him. My breath hitched. My father's watch was in the glove compartment, just like he said. I hadn't opened it in weeks, yet somehow he knew. My hands began to tremble, and I gripped the wheel tighter to steady them. Who told you that? I demanded. His smile widened. I told you, Raj. 
I know you. Enough, I snapped. If you don't tell me what's going on, I'm pulling over and calling the cops. He leaned forward, his face now partially illuminated by the dim dashboard light. The cops won't help you, he said softly, not when you're already dead. The words hung in the air, impossibly heavy. I laughed nervously, trying to shake the unease clawing at me. You've got the wrong guy, I said, though my voice wavered. I'm very much alive. Are you? he whispered. Do you remember the crash? I froze. The crash. A fragment of memory bubbled to the surface, blinding headlights, the screech of tires, and the sickening crunch of metal. But that was a week ago. I had walked away from it, shaken but unharmed. Or had I? Look in the mirror, he said, his voice low and commanding. I didn't want to. Every fiber of my being screamed at me not to. But my eyes moved involuntarily to the rearview mirror. And there I was, or something that used to be me. My reflection wasn't the face I had seen that morning. It was bloodied and broken. My skin pale and waxy, my eyes glassy and sunken. A jagged gash split my forehead, and streaks of dried blood ran down my cheeks. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. Now you remember, the passenger said, his voice echoing like it came from the depths of my mind. You didn't survive, Raj. You're trapped, replaying your final moments over and over, picking up strangers who never get to their destination. You're the ghost story now. I whipped around to face him, but the back seat was empty. The car was silent, the meter flashing zero. My heart pounded as I turned back to the wheel, my eyes darting around the dark, empty street. And then I noticed it. The engine wasn't running, the keys weren't in the ignition, yet the cab was moving, gliding smoothly down the road as though carried by some unseen force. Panic surged through me as I yanked at the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. The windows were fogging up, and words began to appear on the glass, written by an invisible hand. You can't escape yourself. The cab screeched to a halt in front of a darkened alley, and the door unlocked with a loud click. I stumbled out, gasping for air, but the street was unrecognizable. The buildings were warped and crumbling, the streetlights flickering like dying flames. I turned back to the cab, but it was gone, vanished into the night. And then I heard it. A voice, my own voice, calling out from the shadows. Raj, time to pick up the next fare. I never woke up. And every night, I drive that same stretch of road, waiting for the next soul to climb into my cab. It was nearly midnight, and the streets were slick from a light drizzle. The faint glow of streetlights barely pierced the gloom, casting distorted reflections on the wet pavement. It was my fourth shift of the week, and exhaustion was clawing at me, but the bills weren't going to pay themselves. Being a taxi driver meant strange passengers and stranger hours, but tonight had been unusually quiet. I was just about to call it quits when my radio crackled to life. Yasmin, we've got a fare for you, corner of Fifth and Elm, says it's urgent. I sighed, adjusted my rearview mirror, and headed over. When I arrived, I didn't even have to pull over. The man practically threw himself at my cab, yanking the back door open and sliding in with the kind of frantic energy you don't forget. He slammed the door, his hands trembling as he tried to latch the seatbelt. Drive, he barked, his voice rough with panic. Just go. Go as fast as you can. All right, all right, calm down, I said, turning the meter on. Where to? Anywhere but here, he snapped, glancing over his shoulder, his wide eyes scanning the street like a hunted animal. Please, just go. It's coming. I didn't know what it was, and honestly, I didn't want to ask. People who acted like this usually had a run-in with the wrong kind of people or substances. Still, he looked genuinely terrified, and I didn't feel like sticking around to find out what he was running from. I hit the gas, and the cab lurched forward, speeding through the rain-slick streets. I tried making small talk to ease the tension. So, bad night? He didn't respond. Instead, he kept muttering under his breath, something about shadows and how it could smell fear. I kept glancing at him in the rearview mirror, noticing how pale he was, his eyes darting between the side windows and the rear windshield. Whatever had spooked him, it wasn't letting up. Listen, I finally said, trying to keep my voice steady. Maybe you should tell me what's going on. If someone's after you, I can... It's not someone, he interrupted, his voice cracking. It's something. It found me, and now it won't stop until... 
He froze, staring straight ahead. I followed his gaze and felt my stomach drop. There, standing in the middle of the road, was a figure. It was tall and unnaturally thin, its silhouette barely discernible in the misty darkness. But what sent a chill racing down my spine was its face, or rather, the lack of one. It was like staring into a void, its outline shimmering faintly like a heat wave. Don't stop, the man screamed. Whatever you do, don't stop. I gripped the wheel tighter, my heart hammering in my chest, and swerved hard to the left, narrowly avoiding the figure. The tires screeched against the wet pavement, and for a moment I thought I had made it. But then the engine sputtered, coughed, and died. The cab rolled to a stop. Come on, come on, I muttered, turning the key in the ignition. Nothing. Just the hollow click of a dead engine. I felt a cold dread seep into my bones as the world outside grew unnervingly quiet. It's here, the man whispered. His voice was barely audible, trembling with despair. It always finds you. I turned to reassure him, but the words caught in my throat. The back seat was empty. At first I thought he had bolted, but then I saw it. A trail of bloody handprints smeared across the seat and leading out the door. My chest tightened as I followed the marks with my eyes, watching them disappear into the darkness beyond. The rain had stopped, but the air felt heavy, suffocating. A low, guttural noise echoed from somewhere behind me, a sound that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Slowly, I turned to look out the windshield. The figure was closer now. Its form was more defined, but its face or lack thereof was the same impenetrable void. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. It was as though the weight of its presence had pinned me to my seat. Then it moved. Not walking, not running, just a sudden, jarring shift closer, as though the space between us had folded in on itself. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. My hands fumbled for the door handle, and I stumbled out of the cab, my legs shaky beneath me. The street was deserted. No cars, no lights in the surrounding buildings. Just an oppressive silence, and that thing. I ran. I didn't know where I was going, but I had to get away. The sound of my own footsteps echoed unnaturally, as if the street was stretching endlessly before me. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, the noise stopped. My feet were still moving, but there was no sound. I looked down and saw that the pavement beneath me had turned into something else. Something black and pulsating, like tar but alive. I fell, my hands sinking into the inky substance as it pulled me down. I screamed, clawing at the ground, but it was no use. The last thing I saw before the darkness consumed me was the figure standing at the edge of the void, its faceless head tilting ever so slightly, as if mocking my struggle. And then silence. When I woke up, I was back in my cab, parked at the corner of Fifth and Elm. The meter was off, the rain had stopped, and the street lights were flickering. My hands were clean, and there was no sign of the man or the bloody handprints. But the engine... The engine purred softly as though it had never stalled. My heart raced as I gripped the wheel, looking around frantically. The street was empty, eerily quiet. Just as I was about to pull away, a voice crackled over the radio. Yasmin, we've got a fare for you. Corner of Fifth and Elm. Says it's urgent. I didn't respond. My hands trembled as I turned off the radio. And then, in the rearview mirror, I saw them. Bloody handprints smeared across the back seat, fresh and glistening.